This is Professor Paul, and this lecture is on types of evidence, how, the different types of evidence so that what you can is use evidence? in your research well, it's paper information, and how to uh, properly that is facts, use testimony, to documents, etc. Anything that can serve as grounds for a belief, that can prove or disprove an assertion, can establish a fact or truth that is in question. So ideally, evidence is clear, understandable, and it's something that's acknowledged and accepted by your readers, something that your readers will believe in. And evidence, of course, is closely related to the word evident. It's something that should be obvious, something that should be seen, something that makes itself clear when presented to the reader or audience. So now let's look at some different types of evidence. So first, and the most sort of prominent type of evidence that most people are always looking for and that we want to people like to base their arguments in is facts. So what are facts? Um, something that we, it's a word that we use, but what do we mean when we say a fact? Well, a fact is something that's true or is the case. It is the case that the sky is blue, for example. Um, a fact is a situation or event that has occurred. It's a piece of information or data that can be generally agreed upon to be true or provable. Right. So this is what a fact is. It's generally something that has uh, a statement about something in the real world, some physical reality or verifiable situation in the external world. The primary strength of facts is that they're difficult to dispute when they're reliable. Uh, and that's because they're attested to by many people. There's a lot of evidence to support them. It's something that can be obvious uh, that you can just sort of point at. So in order to dispute a fact, you have to usually provide extensive work, extensive study, extensive experimentation in order to dispute facts. Now, this does not mean that facts don't sometimes change. For example, it once was a fact that the sun revolved around the earth. That was the fact because that's what everyone thought. That's what all the evidence that people had proved. But through extensive study, through questioning, through new experiments that changed or challenged the way that evidence was interpreted, a new fact was made, a new fact was discovered that displaced the old one, the earth revolves around the sun. Uh, so again, when they're used properly, facts are very clear, they're understandable. The sky is blue, grass is green, those are all very clear, understandable facts. And so they're a very solid ground to build argument upon. Because you're not re relying on someone to agree or disagree, facts are something that everyone theoretically should agree with, regardless of their position on the larger issue. But the facts provide you a good ground to build common ground and to build a strong argument. Now, what are the weaknesses of facts? And there are many weaknesses of facts. First is, what actually counts as a fact? Um, as I said on the last slide, at one point in our history, it was a fact, it was an accepted fact, that the sun revolved around the Earth, uh, because that's what it appeared to be. So that is no longer a fact, because we've discovered evidence that changes our interpretation of what we see. Uh, but it's also very easy to confuse your judgment or your opinion with fact. And this is because even things that appear to you to be obvious or true are not necessarily verifiable in an easily, object objectively, um, uncontroversial way. So, for example, the statement, Donald Trump is the president of the U.S., is a fact that can be demonstrated without controversy with reference to the external world. All we got to do is find uh, footage of him taking the oath, footage of the election, etc., etc., and we can verify this. However, the statement, Donald Trump is a bad president, no matter how, one, how much one may like to believe that, it's a judgment or an opinion. Now, one can make that judgment based on facts. You can argue that that's true and provide facts to prove your case, but that doesn't make it a fact because everything that you argue, you have to make a case for how those different pieces of factual evidence prove that he is bad as a president. So this is something that's not demonstrable without some controversy or argument or debate. Another weakness of facts is that they require context for meaning. 
facts do not speak for themselves, no matter how much we may want to just offer a list of facts without explaining them, they don't actually prove anything. So you have to think to yourself, what, what makes this fact the case? What makes it true or significant? And how does this relate to the issue at hand? Um, so you could say it's a fact that the sky is blue, but does that relate to what you're talking about? And what can you actually infer or reason or figure out based on that fact? What does it tell you about the situation that you're investigating? And even multiple facts are going to require context or explanation. So you can't just build up a series of facts and expect it to make the argument for you. For example, using one of the logical fallacies that we talked about in a previous exercise, to, these are two facts. Let's just assume that details might be a little bit off, but assuming that these are facts, one, George W. Bush became president in January 2001. The second fact, six months after Bush took office, the stock market had dropped by 20%. Even if both those statements are factually true and demonstrable, they don't prove anything. Uh, we can't make a connection between those two without some other facts and some other explanation. So you need to explain what's the importance of the fact. And one last weakness of facts that I've already touched on a bit is relevance. Facts must be relevant not just to the general topic, but to the specific issue at hand. So they need to be not just about the general issue that you're discussing or things that are related to the issue, but they should have some relationship to the question you're trying to answer. So as an example, let's say you were trying to make an argument to prove you were trying to claim that people who drive SUVs should have to pay some extra tax to cover their environmental effect. So there are a number of different reasons and pieces of evidence that you could offer to prove that fact. But these are all facts. Let's And again, let's just assume these are true for the purposes of this demonstration. Even though they're true, even though they might be related to the general topic of SUVs and taxes, they have nothing to do with the question of whether or not you should, these drivers should pay an extra tax to cover their environmental effect. The majority of SUV drivers are between the ages of 24 and 40. Ford manufactures the most popular SUV. SUVs are more expensive. Higher octane gasoline produces less pollution than lower octane gasoline, etc., etc. These are all questions that probably don't have anything to do with this case. But you might be tempted to throw them in because, again, this is something we see often in the way arguments are made in the public sphere. Just by throwing in some related fact, it can muddy the waters and make it seem like you're talking about the issue when really it's just a distraction. So are the facts relevant to the case? Another very popular and powerful type of evidence is statistics. So what are statistics? It's the science of collecting, organizing, interpreting, and presenting large, amount of, large amounts of numerical data or facts. So it's, statistics are a type of factual reporting, except it's primarily numerical. Statistics are often usually ways of summarizing a large, again, a large amount of data, studies of hundreds or thousands of different subjects, um, surveys, things like that, and they're often represented visually. So the strengths of statistics. Like facts, statistics are hard to dispute when they've been properly collected and properly displayed. Uh, in order to challenge statistics, you really have to do most likely one of two things. You can challenge the method of the data collection. So for example, you could say there weren't enough people interviewed. It's just too small of a selection size, or it was biased in some way. If you are uh, reporting on people's preferences for Coke or Pepsi, and you say 100% of people prefer Coke to Pepsi, but then we find out that everyone you interviewed was, a employer, was employed by Coca-Cola, then obviously your collection is biased, your, your data is biased. The other thing that you can do, as we'll show on a slide or two, is that the way that the data is interpreted or presented can be challenged. Um, but when it's done properly, 
again, statistics are very strong. And that's because they represent a large amount of data in an economical way. We can see long-term trends. We can see what 100, 1,000, a million different subjects, um, how they're reacting to a situation or what they believe, etc., etc. So you can see in a small space a lot of information. And especially when the visuals or graphics are done well, it can convey this in a very powerful way because you get, again, a lot of information transmitted in a small space. So it's very efficient. Weaknesses of statistics. Again, like facts, statistics have to be relevant. They have to relate not just to the general topic, but to the specific question you're asking. So on our example about the argument for an SUV tax, uh, these are statistics, again, collections of facts, that are probably irrelevant to the argument. Charts about how fast the automobile industry is growing. Comparisons of the profitability of different automobile companies. Uh, data on each manufacturer's percentage of the market share. Or even a chart showing that pollution in the US is growing faster than it is in Europe. Well, all these things, again, they talk about cars, they talk about pollution, they don't have anything to do with the question of should we pass an SUV tax? So they're irrelevant statistics that only muddy the waters or distract from the argument itself. Another weakness of statistics is that they can be very misleading or even deceptive in the way that they're presented. So you always have to ask yourself, what's the data that's being presented? What's the scale in which it's being presented or how is it being represented? And what are the relationships between the different data that are being depicted? So we'll look on the next slide at an example. So here's a little test. We have two charts here, two different companies on the left and the right, showing the sales growth of these companies in the millions of dollars uh, from 1990 to the year 2000. So which of these two companies experienced more growth in their sales over this 10-year period? The answer is their sales were identical. It's the exact same data. It's just represented in two different ways. Chart one on the left, the sales looked like they grew more because this, the y-axis only showed us from 90 to 100. So the difference between the lowest score of 93 and the highest score of 99 was appeared much larger. The small scale exaggerated the difference in sales. The chart on the left, on the other hand, had a much longer, a much uh, uh, larger range in the y-axis. It went from zero all the way up to 120. So the differences between 93 and 99 appeared almost negligible because of the large scale. So depending on how you want to present your information, imagine if you are an investor and someone's trying to sell you uh, on buying stock in a company and they present you um, these two different charts, you might be tempted to side with or invest in company A, even though the data is exactly the same. So being paying attention to the way the data is represented, how it's being interpreted, is extremely important. Otherwise, you can be very easily deceived. Another weakness of statistics is, do they tell the whole story? Are there other ways to interpret or present the data? And what other information is necessary? Because statistics are always going to leave out some information. There's always going to be other things that are going to be that other details, other data, other numbers that might change our assessment of what's being presented to us. So this has to do with interpretation and presentation as well. Let's look at an example. So as our fanciful example, let's take this story of dragon attack. In the land of Havelina land, there are two different types of people. There are the purple hares and the green hares who live in Havelina land. Now, unfortunately, Havelina land is also tormented by a vicious dragon named Trogdor. 
he regularly flies into town and eats someone. So we're trying to figure out, is it safer to be purple hair or green hair? Does the dragon kill one group more than the other? Let's find out. So one person comes along and they do a study. They say, you know what? Every year, Trogdor eats 100 purple hair people. But he only eats 25 green hair people. So since 100 is four times greater than 25, the purple hairs are in much more danger than the green hairs. They're four times more likely to get eaten by Trogdor. Seems pretty obvious, right? That's the statistics. But someone else comes along and says, hey, that doesn't really tell us everything. That just tells us the raw number of people who are eaten, but not the number of people who are eaten relative to the total population. So they count how many people are in Havelina land. There's a thousand purple hairs, but only 100 green hairs. So 100 out of a thousand is one out of 10, or 10% 10 of the purple hairs are eaten each year. But 25 out of 100 is one fourth, or 25% of the green hairs are eaten each year. So in other words, it's actually 2.5 times more likely to be eaten if you're a green hair than a purple hair. By looking at this additional factor, this additional bit of information, we see that the story told by the first set of numbers was partial and misleading. It didn't give us a full picture of what was actually going on. This gives us a better understanding. And there could be even more statistics that we might need to investigate to further understand and to refine our uh, uh, assessment of the relative danger. So, for example, how many days of the year uh, does Trogdor ever spit people out, anything like that? Those are other details that might change this even further. So, again, what's the information? What's being left out? What's the story that's being told? third type of evidence that's very important is expert authority. So this is anything that you get from experts in the field, analysis, studies, interpretations, ideas, assessments, whatever you get from people who are acknowledged to be knowledgeable, trustworthy, reliable, and have a deep knowledge and expertise of the subject. Expert authority can be used to strengthen your arguments. Strengths of expert authority. Again, obviously, that the people that you're quoting are reliable and knowledgeable. And because they know the subject well, they can often express their ideas in particularly clear and powerful language. So it's very good to get um, you know, really clear statements of complicated ideas uh, in the language of expert authority to quote them when it's a difficult concept to explain. And they can help you provide interpretations of data and evidence. So you can collect um, the different data from different sources, and the experts can help you to understand how to put those things together by explaining the principles of the topic of the, the discipline that, they're, that you're investigating. And of course, they can lend weight of authority to your ideas. Because they are experts, you can say, this isn't just me saying this. I'm basing this on the expertise of such and such who has 50 years of experience in this field, blah, blah, blah. The first weakness when it comes to expert authority is, of course, the question of, are they really an expert? How reliable is this source? So particularly online, something can appear more reliable than it actually is. Uh, so, you know, slick presentation on the web can make something look very reliable. Conversely, something that is reliable but is put up by someone who doesn't have good web skills can look uh, low budget and unreliable on the web. So always use that crap test. Uh, evaluate for reliability and see, um, is this source really relevant, really knowledgeable, really something I can trust? Another weakness of expert authority is that no expert is beyond question. Um, perhaps their research isn't current. Perhaps there's other information that they're not considering. 
or there might just be logical errors or assumptions in their reasoning. Now, does this mean that they're entirely wrong? Not necessarily. It could just mean that certain aspects of their conclusion or certain interpretations that they make are weaker than others. So even experts can be questioned, even expert authority can be refined, challenged, debunked, modified, etc. And as with facts and statistics, context is crucial when you are quoting uh, an expert authority because it can be very deceptive when you take something out of context. And I've given here a really obvious example, a very egregious example of taking something out of context. But even if you're not doing something this blatant, just taking a quote and plugging it in to your paper without saying this is what the person is talking about, this is what they're responding to, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, makes it confusing. So here's the example that I've given. The original text, your expert authority says, the latest Star Wars movie is really terrible and the best thing to do is avoid it at all costs. But one can very deceptively quote this, take it out of context and just say, the latest Star Wars movie is dot 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 the best. Obviously means the exact opposite of what the original was trying to say, but technically it's not misquoting. It's just quoting part of it and taking it out of context. Another type of evidence that's a little bit less formal than facts, expert authority statistics, are stories and anecdotes. Um, so these are often detailed descriptions of personal experiences uh, of some individual, group, uh, or etc. that's pertinent to the situation. It reveals some aspect of the lived reality of the problem, of the situation, of the topic that's being discussed. The primary strengths of stories and anecdotes. They are detailed and evocative stories, well-told stories, can excite your reader's interest and they can show the human side of the issue. Apart from numbers and facts and so forth, they can show why this issue matters to people. And so they can be very emotionally powerful and connect with the reader. And they can make the reader, again, aware of the real-world consequences of the issue. What does this mean in the real world? What does this mean to other people like me, like you? Why is this important beyond some abstract concept? The primary weaknesses of stories and anecdotes are really the flip side to their strengths. Uh, the emotional appeal that's so useful in, when using a personal story can also obscure the logic and can even be deceptive by riling up people's anger or sympathy. Um, just because someone has powerful feelings about a subject, just because you can excite those powerful feelings, doesn't mean that there's evidence of truth. So it can be easy to get people on your side by telling an inflammatory story or a very uh, pathetic story that excites their pity in order to get them to not think about logical issues and focus on the emotional issues. Um, and even when the stories are not used in that way, there's of course a certain limited applicability to them. They're not necessarily representative of everyone. It might be an extreme case, for example, if you're talking about a certain problem and the way uh, it affects people, you might pick a particularly extreme example of someone who's been affected or harmed by that problem. And that doesn't necessarily represent the total reality, even though it's effective at showing the overall consequences. So there's a certain lack of logical power or logical strength to them uh, because of their limited nature. So how do you use stories and anecdotes effectively in a paper? The main thing is not to use them as your central argument or main proof. Um, unless what your point is is to document a particular individual's life, uh, telling a story, for example, if you're arguing about drug laws, telling a story, only a story about an individual who was unfairly treated as a result of drug laws, doesn't necessarily prove your point. Uh, so instead, use the stories to get your reader's attention. 
Again, communicate the human side of the story. Show why the issue is important to real people and real lives. So even if you're using an extreme example, you're still showing that it's important and you're not necessarily trying to promote this as the absolute truth in all cases. And use these stories and anecdotes to help convince potentially resistant readers to be open to your perspective through empathy. So again, let's say you're, you're making an argument about drug laws and saying that drug laws are too harsh and you might be being read by people who have a very strong law and order sensibility. You're not necessarily trying to change their minds, but you may want to try to get them to sympathize with people that they would otherwise write off as just criminals by showing them as human, even though they're flawed and they might have done bad things. So that reader who was initially very resistant is now more open to your side of things, is now more open to understanding what you have to say. And the final type of evidence that I'll discuss today is analogies. Uh, an analogy is a form of reasoning. It's a logical structure where you compare two things based on some shared qualities or structure or function. So you're using something that the reader already knows about and understands in order to, to explain something that they don't understand. So to take the classic silly example from the film Forrest Gump, the idea, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. So we all know what a box of chocolates is like. We all understand that experience. We know that experience of opening up and you're not sure which one has a nut in it, which one has chocolate, which one has fruit. And so you bite into it and you just got to go with what you get. Um, and so the idea is that's like life. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to be come back at you. Once you act, you just have to bite into it and see what happens. So we're using that simple example of something we understand to explain a much more complicated issue. So the strengths, it's just that, that it helps the reader understand difficult subjects more clearly. It gives them a vocabulary that they can use uh, and it focuses their attention on the essential ideas or functions or qualities so that they can get to the heart of the issue. So the well-constructed analogy shows the internal logic or the essence of the issue, the topic that you're discussing, in very simple terms. And the primary weakness of analogies is that they can be very weak uh, or they can be even deceptive. You could make comparisons based on irrelevant qualities or it can actually make understanding the primary topic more confusing or more difficult. So for example, uh, we saw when we were working on logical fallacies, the false analogy between guns and hammers saying they're both made of metal and they're both tools, but neither of those, that was not really the essential quality. That wasn't the important thing that they had in common. So the comparison was weak. Another example here, cats love tuna and so do dolphins. Since we can keep cats as pets, then we should also be able to keep dolphins as pets. Well, loving tuna is an irrelevant quality when it comes to pets. This is an inane and pointless analogy because it doesn't really help us understand what it would mean to keep a dolphin as a pet. It's just taking some very basic, meaningless similarity and using it as the basis for an argument based on analogy. So making sure your analogy is based on the relevant important quality qualities and really um, truthfully explains the way the idea that you're trying to demonstrate that it actually works. So strong arguments are going to use multiple types of evidence. They'll use analogies, they'll use stories, they'll use facts, statistics, expert opinion. 
um, and they'll arrange this evidence in a manner that effectively communicates their argument. And they'll try to relate different pieces of evidence together in order to mutually reinforce ideas. As I talked about in the Analyzing a Debate lecture, bringing together evidence from different sources in order to reinforce them to show how different pieces of evidence relate to the same reasons, the same general ideas. So just the sort of schematic example here, not put going into specifics, which will be in a different lecture, uh, but you might begin with an anecdote or story about a person that's personally affected by your topic. Uh, so this will vividly depict the problem, the stakes of the issue that you're researching, and the human consequences of the problem. And then you might go into some quotation, some expert authority that defines what the problem is, establishes the issues that you will discuss, establishes terminology that you're going to need. Then as you're building your argument, you provide different facts and statistics that are related to the different aspects of the topic. So you're grounding your argument in reliable data and ideas. And you're doing that, you're using uh, the expert authority to help explain what those facts and statistics mean. And so you're demonstrating your reasoning, the experts are helping you show how your ideas work together, and so forth. So this is a way that you can use different types of evidence in order to support an overall argument, the overall case you're trying to make, the question you're trying to answer. Finally, let's just review the major points. Strong arguments are going to use multiple types of evidence because each type of evidence provides something different. And every type of evidence has its uses but also its limitations. So just because you have a lot of facts doesn't mean that those facts are relevant, doesn't mean that those facts communicate everything. So you always have to check the relevance of your evidence. Does it, is it pertinent to the topic at hand? Is it clear? Is it reliable? Do you have a context that explains its meaning? So you're always making sure that you're using the evidence properly to support your argument rather than just throwing in data that may or may not actually be related. So think again finally about what is it that you're trying to prove? Does this evidence relate to support your overall topic?